And God's people said, Amen. 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 Extol the Lord. Already you're extolling the Lord. I like that. It's beautiful. That is our conference this week is to give him a little extra glory if you can muster it from him to give it back to him. Extol the Lord. Everybody, do you have a brochure? Everybody have one. Is there anybody that does not have one that needs one? I think you're all in good shape. Beautiful. On the back, here's a 30-second look real quick. We are here, and it is Friday. I'm glad that you are here. Friday, October 4th. It says that we're going to have a worship service. We're going to praise God. We're going to open up the Word of God. We'll have some prayer and our special speaker, Kevin Pesky. Everybody welcome Pastor Kevin Pesky. He's in the back back there. And tonight we're going to have Brian Clark. We'll get to him in a moment, but go to the front Real quick, now I'm making you work a little bit. Cody and Millie Clark. Millie was replaced by? By his mom and dad. So, excuse me, did you say Walker and not Clark? I was listening to you, but I didn't believe you. Is that, is your name Walker? Cody, stand up! We welcome Cody Walker. Okay, I'm going to read this now before I start, before I say anything more. Let me see. Car, 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 Carter, Carter. Okay, okay. Lee and Heather Carter, why don't you stand up? We greet you both. Lee and Heather, of course, you are here with us already a little bit, and we'll have you along a little bit more as the, the week and the next few weeks transpire. So uh, this evening, I'm going to uh, simply introduce our guest missionary. Um, we have supported Brian for a lot of years. Brian has been in London, England with his family. Of course, Mindy is here as well, and, and uh, they've been here for a little bit, and they're going to get back over there for a little bit. And uh, I wanted to him to take a few minutes before Pastor Kevin comes to preach, tell us a little bit of where they've been, where they are, and where they're going. So, Pastor, missionary, Brian Clark, come and speak to us. Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, bud. Thank you. There's a mic right there for you, bud. I love, I love, can you hear me all right? I love having these handheld mics. It makes me want to sing a song for you. But I'm almost certain if I did, the glory of the Lord would leave this place, I think, if I tried to. Oh, you guys have your Bibles with you? Um, uh, this, is, um, this is the most important thing in my whole life, is my Bible. This is the reason why we do all of this. And my prayer is that the Lord would order my steps according to his word. If you would, turn to the uninspired pages in the back. Would you do that for me? Turn to the uninspired pages in the back of your Bibles and get your pens out. I want you to mark this down. It's what my granddad used to always say. He, he would always say that. He, he'd say, he'd say, get your pens out and mark this down. And he'd say it like three times and you'd be like, all right, I'll get my pen out. And he'd be like, mark this down now, mark it down. Mark this down. The, the gospel is only good news if it reaches the lost in time. I got that from my grandfather. And uh, it's something that has plagued me and burdened me all of my life. So I just want to share with you a little bit about how it is that our family has chosen to try to do something about that. And uh, I think I have some pictures. There might be a picture. Here's my family. and. Uh, Aren't they amazing? They are, I'm so blessed and lucky uh, that my family um, is obviously so much better than yours. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's very clear you can see that, you know. It's really more of an empirical fact. But like, um, like you can see this lady next to me, that's my wife, uh, Mindy, and she's right here and she hates it when I draw everyone's attention to her. So please, if everyone would just look at her. That is her right there on the fourth row. 
And I, I'm not kidding. Uh, the reason we have a church uh, planted in London today is because of my wife, Mindy. Um, she is the backbone of everything that we do. I mean, I'm pretty much a hot mess most of the time in my life. Wait, well, you don't have to agree. <laughs> You don't have to agree with that. So He agreed so quick, you know, but uh, I am, though, it's true. And she is really the organizational genius behind everything that we do. And uh, without Mindy, there would be no church in London today. And there is one. And I'm so grateful that God, uh, in his grace, uh, has put her into my life. Now, as far as she's concerned, obviously she committed some sin in her life that God stuck her with me. You know, that's the other side of that. So she obviously did something terribly wrong in her youth to deserve me as a husband. But I am very glad that she is in my life. On the other hand, uh, she's a very expensive lady. So that's the reason why we're going around the country raising more support. You know, just to be able to afford the bill on the hair alone, you know, with this one. Good grief. You guys need to pray for me. Uh, it's, it's a very expensive lady. You can see it right there in the eyes a little bit, can you? When you look at her eyes, you kind of see it. And um, my uh, oldest daughter is Madison right here. She's at my, she's at my foot there. And uh, she is an amazing young lady. She's, she's the best soul winner that our church has ever had. And uh, she is just very skilled. All the kids are skilled soul winners. And uh, she is really probably the best of, of all of us in that regard. And then Hudson, you can see him. He is the other reason why we have to raise support because this kid won't stop eating. He's like, at this point now, he's like 6'2". He's like 230 pounds or something like that. I think the last time that I weighed him. And I'm like, every time, I, like while he's eating, he's planning his next meal. Anybody else got some kids like that? Yeah, it's ridiculous. I'm like, would you just slow it down? We're missionaries, man. We can't afford your uh, grocery bill. But he is, the only thing bigger than his appetite is his heart. He is just an amazing young man, loves, to, loves people. And everyone that gets around him just loves him. It, he's so easy to love. And, uh, and then you got Caitlin over here. She is the one, uh, she's like extremely like high maintenance, this one. And she tells us all what to do. And it's so weird because all of us obey her. <laughs> I'm not sure how she started that. She's some sort of evil genius, you know. But she, uh, she tells us all what to do. But she also is kind of my protector. She looks out for me all the time. And she's like, Dad, how much water have you drank today? Are you drinking enough water? I'm like, why don't you back off with the water, man? And she's like, you need to drink your water. I'm like, all right. She really uh, takes care of me in that regard. And then you got Stefan down here at the bottom. He's our family genius. And you can see, again, if you kind of draw in close on the eyes, you can see a little bit of arrogance there, can't you? Do you see that? You can see it right there in his face. Um, and we're hoping that one day he will invent something and uh, we'll all be able to live off of the proceeds. But uh, if you go to the next picture, this is where we live. If you went downtown London on the main street, you might see something like this. 12 million people in the city, uh, less than 2% go to a church of any kind. And, uh, and so it is not a Christian country. It is not a Christian city. It's a very secular, humanistic city. Uh, if you go to the next picture, this is one of the great uh, answered prayers in our life was this guy, Paul Waller. Um, and he is the guy that we trained up. We trained up a local bred, him and his uh, sweet wife, Emma, and their three boys. We trained them up and uh, spent about, I don't know, I spent about at least a year discipling him, and then I spent another six years training him to be a pastor. He turned out to be a fantastic pastor, a fantastic preacher, and um, uh, one of the, it was one day early on, I'm almost out of time, so you won't have to listen to me drone on any much longer, but um, I was walking, I was taking a walk, because Pops used to always take walks, and he would pray, did that every day, and I thought, you know, uh, early days, it was really difficult, I was very frustrated, so I thought, I I'm going to take a walk, and uh, so I was walking along, and I was just praying, and I found this park bench, and I sat down on it, and I was praying specifically over John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And it says, you know, that paraphrasing, he says that if you will do, if you ask anything in my name, 
then I will do it. And uh, that verse to this day, it, I still can't get my head around it. It blows me away every time I read it. This is a verse that I hold on to every single morning when I wake up. And uh, I was sitting there praying, and I was like, Lord, if this is true, what I really want in this life is a disciple who gets it. That's what I want. I want someone who is really on board. I want someone who loves this book as much as you do. And I swear, like a week later, Paul comes walking through the front door of our church. And he was like, from day one, he was like, I came here because I, I need to grow. Uh, I need to be discipled. I need to, uh, someone to get me into the word. And, and we just started down this path. And now this man that you see on the screen, he is my son. He is my son in the Lord. I, I love this man like he is my son. I told him, I said, we'll probably work together for the rest of our lives, planting churches together. And he has turned out to be a fantastic pastor. So the reason why I came here tonight to tell you all that is because you guys have supported us for so long. And your support in all of your prayers has paid off. Uh, now, over in London, we've been there for a little over 20 years. And now over in London, there is a Bible-believing, a King James Bible-believing, disciple-making, soul-winning, expository preaching, dispensational. I could go through the whole list of the secret sauce that makes us who we are. But there is a church over there in London where there was not one before. And that is, that is because of you. Because of all of your wonderful prayers, because of all of your wonderful support. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to go back in January and we're going to start number two. That first church is standing on its own. I, I completely worked myself out of a job in that church. And now they're standing on their own and I'm going to go back and I'm going to start number two. I must be out of my mind. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It's so, it's so ridiculous, isn't it? It's so ridiculous, this idea of missions. It's so silly. And uh, the only reason we're doing this is because God answers prayer. Amen. Because I'm not kidding you. If, if God did not answer prayer, I'd be in front of Netflix eating a bowl of ice cream right now, man. <laughs> the only reason we can do this is because he does. Okay, go to the next. Uh, this is what we're going to do. We're asking God to return to London in January, plant a second church in five years create a network of churches, try to train up men from that network, and we want to send out a missionary of our own. Now that's how I would be able to die a happy man, is if I could send out a missionary, because this is really what we want to do. If you go to the next one, it's, uh, we want to make London a launch pad for world missions. That is the dream right there. That's what we really want to accomplish. And uh, so if you go to the next slide, this is also, this is really stupid. I wrote this book. And nobody wants to read that. So uh, it's, a, it's a book I wrote from the lessons I learned and how to win people to Christ. And so uh, if you want to be a soul winner, pick that up. And, you know, I hope that that would be of help to you. I, I hate doing that. It feels like I'm selling stuff. Anyway, go to, the, go to the next slide. This is really what I want you to do. Use this QR code. Go to our website. If you don't like QR codes, uh, they're a little weird to me. If you don't like QR codes, you can just go to brianclark.org. You can learn all you want about our ministry. You can also sign up for our newsletter. This is what I need you to do. Sign up for our newsletter. That way we can fuel your prayers. We can tell you what's going on with us so that you know how to pray for us. If you sign up for that, it will come directly into your inbox. The only thing that I am worried about tonight, though, is I'm worried that my wife and I, we're going to get into our cars and we're going to drive away. And you guys are not going to know how much we love you guys. That's the only thing I'm really worried about. Uh, we are so filled with gratitude for what you guys have done for us. The way that you have stood by us, the way you've been so faithfully supported us and prayed for us, the way that you have sent teams over, poor Randy had to come over so many times to London and put up with me for weeks. And, and then he would want to come back. And you guys did all of that, and I cannot tell you how grateful we are. And that's really the reason I came, is so that you would know and be able to hear that from me. And so now we're going to go back in January, and we're going to try to do it again. We love you guys. Thank you for your prayers.
Good evening, everyone. It's great to be back here at First Bible Baptist Church. Um, thank you, Brownie, for inviting me and my wife. If you haven't met my wife, Savannah is right over here. Give us all a big wave, please. I'm going to ask you to open up to Psalms 145 here this evening. Brownie reached out to me uh, a while back and, and um, said he wanted to do something a little different this year with the Acts 1-8 conference. And so we talked through it and walked through it a little bit, and, and he sent me this psalm. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting to use an Old Testament chapter of the Bible for your missions conference. But here we are, and I've enjoyed going into the depths of this chapter. Tonight, we're just going to go through the first seven verses. I've entitled it, as you see on the screen, My God. Let's read together Psalm 145. hope you found it. Verse 1, it's going to say this, I will extol thee... My God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless thee and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works, and men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come boldly to that throne room of grace. Lord, we recognize it is a place that we should find help in our time of need. And so here we are, God, we are needy. We're a people that need your direction. We need your guidance. We need your filling. God, we need a, a transformation of our minds, a renewal. We need to pivot from where we are, God. We need clean hands and a pure heart. Lord, would you do a holy work in and through all of us? And I, I know the holiest thing about this night is probably what I just did is reading your holy word. So God, I pray it would not return void. It would uh, accomplish a great work in and through all of us that we would walk out of here with a, a, a red, uh, just a, a passion to truly glorify, to praise, to extol your name. Lord, you are worthy. Would you bring forth your blessings, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm in love with this text as I've read through this more and more and I've studied it more and more. Of course, I have gleaned uh, so much from this and I'm going to spend some time just trying to unpack the Bible over the next few days for us. And I, and I hope that makes sense. I hope that if we come to a missions conference, the focus would really be the message that God has for all of us. I love that phrase, my God. Now, you may have heard that phrase today, maybe yesterday. A lot of people walking around will, will say, oh, my God, uh, but they don't meet it in the same context here, do they? Uh, but in this context, David is really praising the Lord. And, and in the title of my Bible, it says, David's Psalm of Praise. And, and it really is an essential part of who he is, three thousand years ago this has been written and it's written so that we would rightly honor Christ and worship his worthiness now there's there's a lot of things that I declare as my own I, I, I may take you to my neighborhood and say oh, that's my house or that's the car I drive or these are my children and this is my church this is my wife over here this is my school there's a, a lot of things that we would look at and, and say this is uh, this is uh, my own possession my oldest daughter, she plays soccer, and um, she's not a super gifted athlete, okay? But she's a smart girl, and so she has been learning the game of soccer more and more, uh, but unfortunately, you know, she, she hasn't started a game yet, and uh, you know, she, 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 she practices and she tries and she's in the backyard sometimes with me and, and sometimes she'll say, Dad, I, I just, I, I don't know why they don't let me start. How can I prove myself if I'm not out there playing the game? And, you know, as a dad, I'm like, oh man, I want to see my daughter out there. And uh, so, you know, she gets some time to play. Of course, usually it's only when her team is up by three or four goals and she can't do any damage at that point, right? And so they'll put her in and, and she'll play and I'll come off the field and I say, oh, you did really good out there, honey. And she's like, thanks, Dad, you know. And uh, well, this last week, um, you know, my, my, the coaches sat her down and, 
and they said, hey, some, you know, so we've had to make some adjustments on the team, and um, we're going to start you today. And uh, so she kind of was like, <laughs> not sure what she was supposed to do with that, right? And uh, so when I found out about that, there was, there was this something inside of me that was like, that's my girl right there. That's my girl right there. She's out there. She, eh, eh. And you know, when I, when I read this psalm right here, you know, David is looking at God and he's saying, that's my God right there. That's my God. It's an intense passion for him to truly worship the Lord. And, and that is the essence of having an intimate relationship. The hours that I have spent with my daughter kicking a ball and, and, and playing soccer in our backyard and all of the coaching that I've done over the years with her, it, it, it now leads me to that place where I'm looking at her and saying, that's my girl out there playing. That's, the, that's that emotional attachment and that excitement. Brownie's done a great job in that bulletin that you have to see what the word extol means. It, it essentially means to raise up in words, to praise, to exalt, to glorify, to magnify. It's a word that really doesn't show up a whole lot in the Bible. It's a few times in the book of Psalms. It's in the book of Isaiah. It's in the book of Daniel. But although it's not mighty in number, it certainly is mighty in meaning. To praise means we lift up in quality. It means we raise something or we lift it up higher than everything else that is around us. To magnify means we focus, focus in on something. We, we see something with great clarity and understand the precision and the detail of that object. So when we were talking about extolling, we were talking about raising high, and we're talking about focusing with great clarity on the Godhead, who God is, understanding him, the king of glory. So to extol is to ascribe these great qualities. When it comes to the Lord, we want to extol his attributes. We want to, to praise his mighty works towards the people of this world. And before we can ever go out on the mission field and, and doing what a, what a Lee Carter is doing, what a Brian Clark is doing, what a Cody Walker is doing. Before we can go anywhere in this world, we, before we can even cross the street, before we can have a, a genuine desire to, to really reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are going to need a red, hot, passionate worship of God. We are going to need to first raise up. We're going to need to extol. We're going to need to, to magnify my God. We're going to need to truly worship and understand who he is. There is no point in, in crossing oceans or even crossing the streets to tell somebody about a God that we're not even that impressed with. And so we've got to come to this place where we have this red hot, burning passion and fire within our souls to personally worship the God of heaven and earth. That's what we're here to do. If you've ever been around a fire, and uh, I'm, I, I've got four girls, a 14, 12, a nine and a three, you know, in the summertime, it's always go in the backyard and start a, a fire so we can have s'mores, right? And it's nonstop, let's start a fire, let's start a fire. And of course, you know, uh, you, you, you know, as a dad, you like to get that thing cranking, right? You want, you know, you only need a little tiny fire to, you know, for a marshmallow and a little bit of chocolate, but your man card is at stake here, right? So, you know, so you're going to get that thing burning, you know? And, and sometimes it, you get so, it gets so going that you can't even get that, you know, that you come with like a four-foot pole for your marshmallow, and you're, and you're doing one of these things. And, and it's, but, but that fire is so hot and so intense that you can't get to it. Well, if you leave that thing in there too long, it starts to get hot. But if you leave that in there uh, long enough, it'll actually turn red and glow because that fire transfers its heat to that object. And what we're trying to do in this conference is we're trying to get so close to the Lord that we have that transfer of passion and heat into our own lives that we can therefore go into this world with that red hot burning passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. There are six statements in our text that David makes about his God. 
And these are all personal statements coming directly from the heart of David. And and this is what red hot worship looks like. You you see this on the screen here. He says this in verse one, I will extol thee. In verse one, he says, I will bless thy name forever. In verse two, he says, every day I will bless thee. In verse two, he says, I will praise thy name forever forever. Verse 5, he says, I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty. Verse 7, he says, I will declare thy greatness. Now, these are, these are statements of deep ownership, if you will, uh, extolling and praising and blessing and speaking and, and declaring. David is not outsourcing this to the praise team, if you know what I mean, okay? David's not saying, oh, they did such a good job up here, I'm just going to sit back and just enjoy the the song and and the guitar and the drums and all that's going on up there. No, we don't get to outsource our praise to God. Now, now there's people in my church, I didn't see any people in this church that, that, that do this when we're singing, dead as a, dead as a doornail, right? They, they'll stand there, but their mouth doesn't move. There's no expression. There's no emotion. There's no intensity. There's no excitement. There, there, there's no red-hot burning passion inside of them. And if there's no red-hot burning passion inside of you, there will be no red-hot burning passion outside of here to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. You see a progression that's even taking place. David's going to start with praise and worship. He's going to bless the name of God forever. He's going to see the worth of the name of God and praise God simply for that name. And then David is going to speak of the glorious honor of God. And then all, after all that, that is when David is going to declare the greatness of God. You see a progression that's just taken place. Before we jump into to going into all the world or declaring the greatness of God, we're going to stop and praise and bless and know that personal, that name personally. David was a, uh, had this burning red-hot passion because he, he didn't just quickly praise God and, and move on. He just didn't, just didn't get a little warm up by the fire there, if you will, but he was going to sit at the feet of the Lord, truly to praise him and to glorify and worship him because David knew he needed to be red-hot. See, a, a weakness in our praise and our worship to God will lead to a a weakness in our service and our obedience to the scripture. Most Christians will not share the gospel one time this week, this month, this year. Statistically, most Christians will not lead another person to Christ in their lifetime. That's crazy. Why? Because we don't have a red-hot burning passion for my God. If our worship is red-hot passion, others will see that passion and that burn and be drawn to that fire as well. So this is one of the greatest elements of David's life, and, and I would say it's one of the most missing elements of our missional lives. There, there, there's a need for the people of God to be true worshipers of the most high God, to say, hey, this is my God. I want you to see in John chapter 4, this is Jesus speaking. I put this up on the screen for you. He says this, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, the Father is is seeking such to worship him, and and, and he is going to set up parameters to, to, to right worship. He says two things, it must be in spirit and it must be in truth. We don't get to define worship in any willy-nilly manner. We must conform our worship to what truly is pleasing unto God. Just because somebody says, I'm going to a worship service, doesn't mean God has been worshipped. Are, are, are you with me? Okay. Muslims worship, you know. Catholics worship. Mormons hold worship services. Even Satanists have worship services. God gets to define what is true worship and what is not. 
He tells us there are true worshipers, which also tells us there are false worshipers. Very early in the book of Genesis, we see this. Cain and Abel are going to bring an offering before the Lord. An offering is an act of worship. And so we see in the text, God received the offering uh, of the worship of Abel, but he rejected the worship or the offering of Cain. God got to define what is appropriate sacrifice and worship. He is the one. Secondly, we see in the book of Exodus, Moses is given the Ten Commandments. It's written by the finger of God in stone, meaning that these are unchangeable things, right? And the second commandment gives, uh, given to Israel is that of false worship. We're not to make any graven images or bow down and serve them. If we do, it would be false worship. So God rejects this worship when it's given through his creation or man-made images, if you will. And then right on the heels of this whole thing, we see Aaron, while Moses is up in the mountain, Aaron takes the bracelets and the rings that are made of gold, throws them into a fire, and what pops out is this golden calf. And and Aaron says in Exodus 32, he says, Thee be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of Egypt. You know what this is? This is worshiping the true God, but in the wrong manner, in the wrong manner. Thirdly, we see Moses warn and instruct in Deuteronomy chapter 12. He says to the children of Israel, when you go into the land and conquer uh, uh, those nations, that you don't inquire after the gods of the land and, and learn to serve those gods doing likewise. See, the false worship in that context is allowing the culture and the lost community to dictate what our worship of God should look like. God is the one that defines it, not our culture and not the lost community around us. What is really pleasing to God? Lastly, fourthly, we we see Jesus speak about false worship when he condemns people as hypocrites for making the commandments of God of none effect by your tradition, he says. He says, in vain do they worship me, teaching the doctrines, uh, the commandments of men. It, it is often traditions that even sneak into Baptist churches that overrule what the Scripture says. I, I mean, we have traditions uh, that dictate the clothes we wear, the songs that we sing, uh, uh, all that takes place in a, in a church ends up being tradition. And, and God says, you have made the traditions of men more important than the commandments of God himself. I've been in churches where there are hymns only. That's it. There are hymns only church. What that means, if you're not familiar with that terms, is that, that it's essentially ungodly to sing anything that's, that's not a hymn. It's not a hymn. You say, well, why would, why, what, what do you mean? Okay, well, well, they believe that the hymn book is somehow inspired, and, and, and this is the way that, you know, they did it, uh, uh, you know, 100 years ago, and then there's revival, and we see that, and so we're going to stick to the hymn book. You say, you don't like hymns? I love hymns, okay? Eh, 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 eh. But when you say, all we're going to do is use a hymn book, you've made that a tradition instead of a doctrine of God, Okay? And then there's churches that are like, man, hymns, those are for old people. We don't want that. It's time for, 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 for the new, and, and so we're bringing it. And, and all they'll do is contemporary worship. And, and, and you say, Pastor Kevin, what do you have against contemporary worship? I love contemporary worship. I do. I do. In fact, Paul says that we should have psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You know, the Bible just gave us a blend of genres that are appropriate for worshiping God. But when we single out those genres and say, we're not going to do that because we're afraid of that, we're not going to do it because we prefer this, we've just made a tradition out of it. And now it's false worship. Are you still with me? I bring up all this to remind us there's a, there's a right way and a wrong way to worship God. And a, and, and a quick preview of the Bible has shown mankind has a propensity to falsely worship God. 
we can be quick to say, God knows the hearts of people. We just relax. Well, that's the problem. God does know the hearts of people. And so he has, he has set us up parameters because false worship is unacceptable because the world around us is full of false worship. We find ourselves in a place of bringing the gospel in order that we would uh, help people to rightly worship the Father. Uh, let me clarify that the world is very busy worshiping right now. There's not a problem with worship. Uh, uh, I, I, I mean, where I'm from, we're fans of the Buffalo Bills. I, I mean, there's probably a lot of Buffalo Bills fans in here. Anybody with me? Okay. Any, any, uh, you know, we, are, we're, we call ourselves Bill Evers. We're believers. We're the godly team. Okay. Okay. But every Sunday, you know, there's 70,000 people and it's worship. I'll be honest with you. There's nothing godly about what's taking place. I'm sure in Kansas City, it's nothing like that. People are designed by God to worship. But without the gospel, there is no biblical worship. It's a false worship created from the image of, of our own hearts. So this is where the, the Great Commission is going to start. It starts with a red-hot burning and personal desire to praise and to worship the King of glory. That Alpha and Omega, the, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Adonai. The creator, the provider, the sustainer, my savior. This is where it's all going to start and finish. We go nowhere without wanting to praise my God. And this is a missions conference. It's not a worship conference. But the command of the Lord Jesus is to, is to go into all the world and preach the gospel message, making disciples and seeing churches started and strengthened. And the gospel doesn't, doesn't simply help people get better, if you will. It doesn't modify people's behavior only. It, the, the, the gospel is not about giving people a second chance, if you will. The gospel brings a person from dead to alive. The gospel brings a person from the power of Satan to the power of God. Acts chapter 1, it's not on your screen, but I assume you know it at this point. Verse 8 says, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Ye shall be witnesses, the Bible says. What through? Through the work of the Holy Ghost, we will witness, we will testify. This is God's divine imperative for all of his people. Okay, if you would raise your hand and say, I'm born again, I have repented of my sins and my faith, called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are called to be a witness, both in Jerusalem and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Oh, I don't feel called. Yeah, well, then you're not a Christian. I don't know what to tell you. You don't get to pick and choose which part you think is for you. This is a divine imperative for all of us that we would go forth into this world. Jesus, I, I love how he say it, says it in Matthew 28. He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. All power. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> is there anything more radical and powerful than the full empowerment by the Lord Jesus Christ to go on mission in this way? Why such an emphasis on the gospel? Maybe you're thinking to yourself, uh, why are we here looking at all these different script, uh, scriptures and thoughts? Because the people of this world are dead in their sins and their trespasses. And there's only one mechanism that awakes the dead. And it's the voice of God. It's so powerful and so profound. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 tells us that the, the word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, right? Uh, we quote it and we think about it and we talk about it. But the, the, the story is powerfully illustrated, illustrated in, in John chapter 11, the story of Lazarus. How many know this story? It's a great story. And, and every time I read it, I'm like, wow, 
what is really going on in this story? Jesus has this friend. His name is Lazarus, Mary and Martha in this story. Really great people involved. Jesus is busy about doing his, his work of the ministry and all sorts of things are going on. And then he gets word that Lazarus is sick. And essentially he says, it'd be good if he was sick. He's not sick. They say, well, should we go? And he's like, well, we'll get there. And by the time he gets there, it's been four days and Lazarus is dead, properly dead. And everybody's, you know, there's a great stir. Jesus is coming in and people are saying things like, if he would have gotten here earlier, this wouldn't have happened. Why did he delay? Why didn't we just go? It's one of his best friends. I, I, I mean, you know, there's all this tension in the air and, and, and almost like Jesus disappointed. Jesus said, listen, all of this is for the glory of God. I want you to know that. And then Jesus gives a lesson and, and says, hey, uh, you know, and talks about the resurrection. And they all good Bible students say, yes, we know that there will be a resurrection of the dead at the end. Jesus says, if you believe, you'll see the glory of God in all of this. Jesus points this out. People are missing out on what is supposed to happen. And, and then in what seems to be one of the greatest miracles given in the scripture. And by the way, this is the, the miracle that's essentially going to put the, the nail in the coffin for Jesus. It's going to unite the Sadducees and the Pharisees against Jesus after this to say, this guy is too powerful. We need to get rid of this man. It's after this miracle that we see uh, they are just rabid to come after him at, at, at this whole thing. And so now Jesus tells them, hey, I want you to roll away that stone that was keeping Lazarus in the tomb. And Mary and, and Martha and everyone else look at Jesus and say, ah, it's going to stink. This is not a good idea. Yet Jesus reminded everyone the sickness of Lazarus, this death, death of Lazarus was for the glory of God. And then one of the most absurd sentences that any of us would ever think to utter, Jesus is going to speak. And why I say it absurd, because Lazarus has been dead four days. Hey, we're not talking he's in a deep sleep here or he's just unconscious or, or, or you know, or, or, or whatever it might be. No, no, he is gone. He is absolutely dead. And Jesus says in John chapter 11, verse 43, Lazarus, come forth. And that dead man heard the voice of God. And rose up. Well, I know we're Baptists, but if we were a little Pentecostal, I bet you Lazarus was doing a move or two even. I bet you he had some things shaking. He was probably like, whoa, this is feeling good. When the dead body heard the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, the dead body came to life. And this is what happens when Jesus speaks. The dead are going to hear. Now, spiritually, I'm not talking about, well, let's go to the morgue. Let's go to graveyards and cemeteries and try this out. Okay, we're, we're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the word of God and the voice of God that brings people from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And the dead cannot praise God. The dead cannot worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Only the living can give glory that is due to his name. Now, there's a false concept of, uh, that the people of this world are living in a, in, in a darkness that's it's not very dark. We just need to turn on some lights and everything. Maybe we just need to overturn some. We just need to vote the right people in, and the lights will come back on, and, and we'll go back to living a very a lighty world, a very righteous world. Everything is going to just get better if we could vote the right people in. I mean, uh, mostly people are, are decent and good human beings, and, and there's, there's goodness in a lot of these people. But the Bible paints a much different picture. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1 for just a moment. Paul has written this text. I'm not going to read everything. 
But starting in verse 19, Romans chapter 1, verse 9, he says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Boy, that's worth chewing on. And he says this, so that they are without excuse. Now it, gets, it starts to turn right now in verse 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. Now look what it says and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. You know what the people of this world had? A knowledge of God, but they willingly denied that knowledge and turned away. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 3 and he says, um, just if you missed what I wrote in Romans chapter 1, let me be very clear in Romans chapter 3. There's none righteous. Can't even find one of them. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. He finally says in, in verse 23, let me just say, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, a, a low view of, of sin is going to give us a low view of the need for the gospel. But the Bible portrays sin as absolutely devastating as depravity, as, as spiritual death. And if the heart of a man is not intercepted by the incredible grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will forever be set on a lust to indulge and fulfill itself in every fancy it can find and every idol that it can pursue in vain worship. You know what drugs... You know what alcohol, money, sex, trophies, positions, these are all idols. We worship all false gods that promise us riches, fame, and, and fullness, but leave us empty and broken. Why? Because man's heart is an idol-making factory. We all are created for worship. And until we receive the gospel... Our worship is at minimum misplaced, but more likely absolutely offensive to the Lord. But when the gospel transforms us, now we are finally able to rightly worship God in spirit and in truth. I like what John Stott said here. He said, the highest of missionary motives is neither obedience to the Great Commission, not love for sinners and perishing, but rather zeal, burning and passionate zeal for the glory of Jesus Christ. Only one imperialism is Christian, and that is the concern for his imperial majesty, Jesus Christ, and for the glory of his empire. See, it's all about the praise and the worship of Jesus Christ. The, the Acts 1-8 conference, it really has a question of purpose. Why do we do missions? Why do we sacrifice? Why do we leave our homes and our country and our jobs to go around the world? Why does God call these men and these families to go and do this? Well, for some people, the answer is so that people would be saved from their sins and not go to hell. That's a good answer. Some people would say, well, so their lives would be transformed and they can enjoy the abundant life that God has promised. I think that's a fair answer. Some people would say that so, that so they can be forgiven and be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ and spend forever with the Lord. I like that answer. Some would say we go because it's commanded and we are to obey. I'm a fan of obedience. Well, if we don't go, who is going to go? And those are all good answers. And maybe there's variations of that, those answers we could talk about. Uh, but, but I really do be the, the very best answer on why we want to see people saved is because Jesus Christ alone is worthy of all praise and glory and blessing and honor. And right now, the world is filled with billions of people that have their worship misplaced 
in things and possessions and titles and reputations and not in the majesty of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So let us go into the world and preach the gospel that a red-hot, passionate worship of the Lord Jesus Christ would ignite around the globe and from generation to generation we would speak of him. John Piper said, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions. Because God is ultimate and not man. It's a powerful quote. Worship, therefore, is the, the fuel of missions. It, it's, it's the goal of missions because missions, we simply aim to bring the nations into that white, hot enjoyment of God's glory. So the, 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 the goal of missions is the gladness of the people and the greatness of God that we would at the end be satisfied and filled because of our nearness to who he is. So all this weekend, as we go through this great Psalm 145, we, we're going to be learning more of who he is. I love as, as you peruse through the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, uh, worship is everywhere. It really is this glimpse into eternity that John gives to us, that the Holy Spirit pulls back the curtain and allows us to look into this window of eternity and to see what is going to take place. In Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, you see the 20 and 4 elders fall down and cast their crowns before the Lord in worship, it says. Revelation chapter 7, all the angels and elders and beasts fell before the throne to worship. I mean, this is not boring worship, y'all. This is not people just standing there cold, bored, waiting for the next song, waiting for the next thing, waiting for the football game to get started or whatever it is. These are people that are crying out to the Lord, casting all their crowns before him, crying out, holy, holy, holy. Revelation 19, the 20 and four elders fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne. Uh, Revelation chapter 22, the very last chapter, it says, worship God. <laughs> We've been placed on the earth to be blown away by the glory of God and passed down that awe to the world around us. Go back to Psalm 145. I want to buzz through here real quick. Psalm 145, he says in verse 1, I will bless thy name forever and ever. Boy, it's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to bless that. There is none under other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Verse 2, he says, every day I will bless thee. Every day. And I will praise thy name forever and ever. I love what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Verse 3 of that chapter, he says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. I love this level of greatness. It's exalting. It compares the greatness of God to all others. And it says, the greatness, unsearchable. It's almost like, where does it stop? It's ridiculous to think about the greatness of God. The, the, The... I mean, if you look in the beginning of Genesis, it, it, God is like, how do we do this? Oh, let me speak. And the world itself was formed. Amen. Well, what did he use? His words. Amen. That's right. Greatness. Amen. I mean, think of all the different stories that in the scripture, uh, the, the 10 plagues that came to Egypt. I, I mean, he used the length of a man's hair to defeat an entire nation. I mean, he's just like, well, what do we do today? How about we draw his hair out a little bit and we'll use this guy to wreak havoc across a nation. How about five stones of David? How about one sword of Gideon? How about the faith of Abraham? How about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of his own son? the greatness of the Lord. Verse 4 says, One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty works. See, this greatness is to be passed along to each generation. The people of God are to declare the acts of God. This word declare is not simply a data transfer. It's not simply 
information that we are passing on. When you talk about declaring, you are talking again about that red hot passion. You're taking what you believe, okay, and you're giving it to your family, okay? You're discipling your children and the people in your network to know the mighty acts of God. Now, um, we do discipleship, and I believe in discipleship, but sometimes I feel like discipleship is, is, is just connecting brains of two people and transferring data across the network, and then when you're done with that certain lesson, you've been discipled. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the greatness of God, this infinite, unsearchable God. We can't complete that in a lesson. And sometimes we make it so, 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 academic it's not just the knowledge of god it's an intimacy it's about lighting the torch it's about passing the torch of your red hot passion to another generation and lighting that for them as well Verse 5, he says, I will speak of thy glorious honor and thy majesty and of, uh, of thy wondrous works. We're again seeing that declaration, that honor and majesty, the works of God. Verse 6, men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. Man, he, he uses the word terrible. I mean, have you ever read the Old Testament? I mean, it does seem like the Old Testament's a different book than the New Testament. When my wife and I, we lived in Zambia, Africa for 11 years, and, and uh, we came into a community... And we, um, there was a whole bunch of other uh, expatriates, and so we got together with them, and we decided we we're going to do a Bible study together. And they said, why don't you do the leading of the Bible study? And I said, sure. And uh, one of the ladies, this sweet older lady, she looked at me and she said, I don't want to do anything out of the Old Testament. I don't like the Old Testament God. I said, what do you mean by that? <laughs> like, they're kind of the same God, right? In her mind... The God of the Old Testament was way too hard, way too terrible. And the God of the New Testament was a very nice, easy to get along with guy. And boy, when you see that, you see the holiness and the greatness of God, and yet you see how terrible God is that he would sacrifice his own son. Verse 7 says, they shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. We are to be a people that sing of the rightness of God. It's supposed to be in our songs and from our hearts. Do, do, do we see where our, our, our fuel is to, to speak, to declare, to utter the memory, to sing of his righteousness? It, it comes from, it, it, it's, because, it's because of my God. It's that nearness. Where does this all come? Because I know him and I desire to be closer to that fire. And the closer I get to that fire, the warmer I burn. And when I finally walk away from that fire, I have a red hot passion to go out because I know my God is able. He's able. He's able. I know my God is able. And I'm willing to go out and I'm willing to, to tell my neighbor or I'm willing to go across the country. Why? It's going to burn inside of me. And I'm looking at you going, you're worshiping, but you don't have a true red-hot passion for the glory of God. All you're doing is worshiping the things of this world. Man, I, I know you all been the same place as I've been. You, you walk down the streets, you go to the malls, maybe, maybe you've been to a football stadium or, or something like that, and you see thousands and tens of thousands of people seeking the pleasures of this world, drinking, using drugs, sex, whatever it is, and ruining and destroying their lives. Maybe you're guilty like I am of saying, man, we need to help, we need to provide more, we need to do this, we need to change our laws, we need all this. At the end of the day, what we truly need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're never going to give people the gospel of Jesus Christ unless we are personally have a real burn and a desire to worship and praise God. It has to be. We get to be a small part of turning people from false worshipers into true worshipers. Maybe you haven't been to a campfire in a while. 
Maybe you haven't felt that heat in a while. Maybe, maybe you're, you're singing along with a team, but you're just distracted, or words are coming out, there's nothing happening inside. I've been there. I've been there. And I'm a pastor. There's no person that stays warm by themselves. We all have to come back and get the heat so that we continue to have the red hot passion burn inside of us so that we can worship and enjoy our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when we have enjoyed that worship so much, now we get to go and tell others. And it's no longer a chore. I'm a Bills fan. I think you should be a Bills fan. I think everybody should be a Buffalo Bills fan. I can tell you the starting lineup on both sides of the field. Uh, I, can, I took my daughter to a, a Bills, Buffalo Bills practice, and after the practice was over, she wandered down to the front row, and, and uh, I wasn't paying attention. Next thing I know, she's high-fiving uh, the best quarterback in the NFL, and, and, <clears throat> and, and, and you know, we're just having a, just having a, a great time. All these people in this place have a desire, have a direction they want to go. I have a, I have a enjoyment for this football team, and, and I've passed that enjoyment on to my daughter. She burns because I burn. She goes to school and tells her friends that the Bills are the best team in the NFL because she got that from her daddy who told her the truth. And when we burn with God, it's not going to be a chore to go tell people about Jesus Christ. It's going to be a pleasure. So, where's your heat? Are you burning? Or have you cooled off? Let's pray together. Father, we're so very grateful for your love. Thank you, God, for your patience. I know there's times that we're cold. I know there's times that we're warm. God, we want to be a red hot. We want to have a passion, a fervor for you. We want to bless your name, your worth, your greatness. You alone, God, we want to praise. Forgive us for all the false worship that we have brought into life. Now would you transform us, O oh God. May we have that nearness to you and enjoy you forevermore. We pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.